Hi everyone, welcome to the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts. My name is Jillian McMaster, Manager of Publications and Media, and I welcome you to the second installment of Art Bites. Today we are joined by Chef Ashley Peel from Blue Ridge Community and Technical College, the museum's Agnita M. Stein Schreiber Curator, Daniel Folco, and the museum's director, Sarah Hall. If you were pre-registered for this program, you received a list of ingredients in your email for today's dish, so feel free to follow along if you would like to. You can use the chat functions on Facebook or Zoom to ask any questions you may have about the meal or the featured work of art. Thank you and welcome Chef Ashley and Daniel and Sarah. Thanks Jillian and thanks everybody else for being with us today. Um, I'm so happy that you've joined us for part two of our new collaborative program, Art Bites, in which we are exploring paintings from the exhibition Bernini and the Roman Baroque, masterpieces from the Palazzo Chigi and Ariccio, along with a generous portion of Italian food and history. At the museum, we're thrilled to have this major exhibition in our galleries the paintings are from the collection of the Museum of the Roman Baroque, which is typically housed in the Palazzo about 16 miles from Rome. This immersion in the Roman Baroque feels especially exceptional to us right now, since we've all just been through a year of relative confinement. Um, we're really, I think, ready to savor the art and the flavors of somewhere else. Before we get started, I want to acknowledge the that the exhibition was organized by Global Project Consulting and toured by International Arts and Artists of Washington, DC. And I would also like to thank the following for major support of the exhibition. Howard Kaler, the James and Mary Schurz Foundation, an anonymous donor, Dr. and Mrs. Robert K. Hobbs, Ms. Susan Chemnitzer, Conservate Inc., and Mr. Louis Kawaja. Finally, we are so fortunate that we found a team of creative, enthusiastic partners from the Blue Ridge Community and Technical Colleges Academy of Hospitality and Culinary Arts. The chefs are donating their time to this program, and the funds that would have paid their honoraria are being used to create a $1,000 scholarship to the program for a Washington County resident. Today, you have the museum's Agnita M. Stein Schreiber curator, Dr. Daniel Fulco, who is going to introduce our artwork. And please do come see it in person. The exhibition is on view until September 19th. And Chef Ashley Peel is going to transport us to the Italian countryside with her rustic pasta creation. I'm just going to give you a little more background on Chef Ashley Peel. Um, she is the food truck chef and structure instructor at the program. She has over 20 years of experience in the food service industry with an associate's degree in culinary arts from St. Louis Community College. She is an American Culinary Federation certified culinarian and her experience includes fine dining, fast casual dining, catering, and quick service establishments. So um, that is it for me. I'm going to turn it over to Daniel and he's going to introduce us to some art. Thank you, Sarah. And if you just bear with me one moment, I'm going to share my screen with you where I have a PowerPoint and we're going to talk a little bit about the featured work today. So welcome to this edition of Art Bites. As Sarah mentioned, it's uh, the, ex the piece that I'm going to discuss is drawn from the exhibition, Bernini and the Roman Baroque, Masterpieces from Palazzo Chigi in Ariccio. And this exhibition has many works in it that are related to religion, they are related to history, but we also have works of art that are related to the natural world. And this one in particular was chosen to be paired today with Chef Peel's dish because it is rustic. The entire nature of the composition, it is a landscape. And we might even think of it here, Jan de Molper's landscape with hunting scene is inspiring some of these ingredients. As I was looking at the painting, one thing that occurred to me is that some of the colors that you'll see in the creation that Chef Peel will make are very similar in terms of the earth tones, the brown, and also the greens. Some of the other colors sort of play off of the dish um, in an interesting way. So I'd like to also point that out. We might imagine going out into the Roman countryside into a Roman garden and being able to pull some of these ingredients from nature. And I will come back to this painting in just a moment. I'm gonna give you some background about Jan de Momper. But first, let's point to where we are talking about. The artist today, Momper, he originally came from Antwerp. And that's up here in what's today Belgium. And then after what he's going to do is he's going to emigrate down to Rome. He becomes basically an expatriate from his native country. 
He sometimes is also call, called Giovanni de Montpere because he becomes almost adopted Italian. A Flemish landscape painter by training, he is believed today to have come from a prominent family of different artists. And he initially will uh, go down to Rome and have some training. And then what he does is he later on in his career sort of establishes this characteristic style that you see in the painting that I'll go into more detail about on the lower right. But he creates this work for this gentleman here. His name is Cardinal Flavio Chigi. And he, his family is the namesake for part of the title of the exhibition. And he, Mr. Chigi here, the Cardinal, is actually the patron of the work of art that we're looking at here. So in the 1660s, he engages this artist to do some work for him in his palace. But before Montbert worked for Kiji, he was actually in the service of other colleagues of the Cardinal, specifically the Pamphili family of Rome, who were also important members of the, uh, the church aristocracy, if you care to call them that. They included popes as well as cardinals, a very powerful and wealthy family. So Montpere is able to get himself into these Roman noble circles. And it is likely that the Pamphili family may have introduced him to Cardinal Flavio Chigi here over on the left. What's very interesting is that Montpere is likely the nephew of an artist who may sound familiar to some of you who are familiar with Flemish landscape painting, a man named Jos de Montpere, who's very likely his uncle. So the younger Jan would have likely before he left Flanders or Belgium would have studied here with Jos. And I like to point this out because this is a phenomenon, the idea of painting landscapes and including the aspect of hunting that emerges before 1600. And one of the reasons it gives rise to this is that we have the Protestant Reformation in Northern Europe that leads to, in some regards, um, a new move into an interest in non-religious subjects and specifically secular art. This sort of emerges as the 1500s come to a close and it really skyrockets in the 1600s. Montpere is part of this northern, what we call Dutch, Netherlandish, and Flemish tradition of depicting the natural world around us. So we have to think of him when he painted this grand landscape that is in the exhibition as coming out of this tradition of but in this case, he is sort of adapting it, and I'll explain that. But this is what he would have been familiar with. And you'll note the hunting dogs in this scene. You have these aristocrats who are on horseback. They're guiding those dogs. And this is actually a boar hunt. But the painting that we're looking at today is one in which deer are being chased. And in fact, if you look carefully here, you've got a stag, you've got the doe, and then you have the um, fawn the baby over here on the left. You see over here that the hunters are using these hounds to chase down the animals, which are making their way towards this river. The composition is really expansive and we encourage you to see it in the galleries if you have a chance. It's really makes quite an impact. It's a horizontal canvas. And there's a lot going on in it. You have the hunting scene here. You have what look like travelers or perhaps other hunters walking here faintly in the middle ground. If we take a look here and move towards the background of the composition, you'll see smoke is coming out of what looks like a small town, perhaps out of a chimney, and then a ruined tower. And we might ask ourselves, how did Mumper conceive this kind of composition? Because if you look at the landscape, it doesn't really look like Northern Europe. Unlike what we have here with his uncle's painting, which looks like it incorporates elements from perhaps Germany, or even points north of that into Scandinavia with the uh, craggy mountains and alpine influence from the uh, Alps. What he's doing, Montbert, is when he comes down to Rome, he is seeing paintings like this one by an artist who would have been uh, almost a, uh, his uncle's contemporary, Anibale Caracci, a very famous uh, uh, pre-Baroque painter. And Caracci specializes in creating Italianate landscapes, that is, um, scenes of the natural world that are derived from the uh, Roman countryside or Campania. They're often very poetic. They show an idealized setting with these figures as well as trees with rivers and bridges. So this kind of compositional model in the Italian style is sort of blended by Montbert with what we see up here 
in the landscape of the boar hunt, what he was used to from coming from the north, he pulls those together and he creates this really expansive scene that we see here. And there's this tremendous movement in the painting of the hunters with the dogs, the dogs chasing the deer. It pulls us through the foreground of the composition. Just like Karachi and also the, the elder mother, look at how he uses the trees here for very dramatic effect. They act as anchors or wings to the overall composition. Then he also positions these large boulders, these rocks here, cliffs, and creates an element of the fact that it looks like we're looking at something that uh, makes us want to be in the scene, so to speak. And he also adds in the waterfall too, in the broken trees. It's really a very beautiful composition. Another thing that I should mention is that his patron, Flavio Chigi, desired to have a painting that would take him out of the interior of his house, for example, by looking at these, this would have been displayed in the palazzo, and it would have brought him into nature. So this was something that became popular at this time, was to have pictures that depicted nature and being out in the countryside. So Montpere is actually very interestingly part of a group of artists, so a broader group called the Ben uh, uh, Fugels, which is a dialect of what's today called Luxembourgish or Flemish language. And it translates to Dutch for, or Flemish for birds of a feather. This was a society of mostly Dutch and Flemish artists who live abroad. The society or association lasts for about 100 years in the early 1600s through the early 1700s. And very interestingly, we believe that Montbert was part of this group of artists. And there's Montbert. There's another work in the exhibition, if you come to see it, and a colleague of Montbert, his name was Cornelius von Pullenburg. And I just wanted to pull this in to point out some of the connections. Here we are back out in nature. Look at those earth tones again that both artists are using. Now, Pullenberg has a very different interest. He likes to depict ruins. But the two guys were actually part of this group. And here are those bent fugles in a Roman tavern. They come from the north, they settle in Rome, and many of them actually end up staying there. What's very interesting is that in this drawing on the right, here is actually the artist that we're looking at here, who created this, Pullenberg. Pullenberg was with these guys, and this is a spontaneous drawing that was created sometime in the mid-17th century. And it's neat to see them conversing with one another. They decided to make their home Italy, essentially. For Montpere, so much so, that he actually married one of his colleague's daughters, and they um, got married. He got married to an Italian uh, woman. So this was uh, quite... Uh, interesting. And just to give you a little context for where this painting would have appeared, we would have seen this in just outside the doors for this room over here called the Sala de Cani, the Hall of the Dogs, in the Palazzo Chigi. So it would have gone over the, the entranceway to this room. And the works that were inside of this room were done by a series of other artists. So basically, uh, Momper is working on a collaborative project. They are intended, these paintings, not necessarily the one by Momper, but the one by his colleagues, one of the artists named Michelangelo uh, Pace, to represent the properties, the land holdings of Flavio Chigi, who's depicted up here. So Chigi really wanted to show off his wealth, and one of his pastimes was actually hunting. So what an appropriate setting for these landscapes. These ones here, though, are very likely by Pace, and then another artist named Bernardino Cesari. So this gives you a sense of the overall context in which a work like this was created. And I should point out, this is a very finished composition. The brush strokes are actually quite tight. They're uh, very um, uh, uh, pulled together, a very polished surface. But this is an example of one of Mopper's works that's a little bit more of a sketch. This is called The Deer Hunt, and it dates from about the same period, mid-17. Look at how thickly he applies the paint to the surface. Um, almost impasto-like brush strokes, impasto referring to the use of these uh, thick application of the pigments. And again, this is a deer hunt. So he was actually working in a somewhat experimental style for the period, again, with greens 
and also browns. So he really liked to use these earth tones a lot in his paintings. Mumper also created some very idealized scenes like coastal landscape with Christ and the apostles. This gives you a sense of some of this other works. This one is actually biblical. It's Christ with the apostles by the seaside. But again, he incorporates in those geological elements, the craggy cliffs and also the uh, trees and the vegetation. And a couple of others, just to give you an idea, his Italianate landscape with herdsmen. He was really fascinated by these different kinds of uh, countryside rustic bucolic scenes. Again, using that very sketchy style here, it almost looks like it could be a study for a larger work and very appropriate to today with the uh, thinking of how you might pair Chef Peel's dish. Well, we've got wine. We've got a grape harvest that's also created by Montbert, a very personal work. You can see these um, uh, winemakers who are gathering the grapes from the vineyards and they're pulling them out here into the foreground, filling baskets and it shows abundance and tremendous beauty. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Chef Peel and she's going to show you how to make this delicious recipe. So we're gonna go ahead and jump right in um, and get started on some things because as we work on the pasta, there will be some lag time with different steps in the process. Um, and as you do this at home, if you do it multiple times or come back and visit the video, you'll see, you'll see what I mean. Um, so when we get into some of those lags, you might check back in with Daniel, some more about the painting and the artist, um, just to you know, keep things moving. So first, we have all of our mise en place set out here. And if you're familiar with that French phrasing, mise en place means everything in its place, right? So the best thing you can do before you start a recipe is make sure you have everything for the recipe. Um, so we have everything already measured out here. And we're gonna go ahead and mix our flowers. So we have the semolina flour, which is actually a durum wheat. It looks similar to cornmeal, but it's much finer ground and it's wheat, not corn. We're gonna mix that and that's 4.5 ounces. And then we're gonna mix 4.5 ounces of the 0000 flour. And I prefer to use my little baby whisk here just to make sure that both of the flowers are fully incorporated into each other. If you can see there in the bowl. Um, so you'll see the one is very a very light white color and the other is a yellow. And as you get kind of that cream color, you can tell that they're fully incorporated. And then you are going to want to put, you can use the all-purpose flour. If that's, if that's all you have, I see that there was a question there. You can use the all-purpose flour, no problem. This is gonna be, um, gonna give you a slightly better quality. Um, it's gonna be more elastic because there are higher proteins. Um, it'll just make it easier when you're rolling the pasta um, if you have the finer ground flour. And next we're going to mix our water and our salt. And then we're gonna put that in the well. I'm gonna run it so you might hear the, the sink running. I prefer the, the temperature on the water to be between 100 and 110. If you can get it a little bit warmer out of your tap or off your stove, however you prefer to warm up your water, um, that's gonna help start to cook some of the proteins a little bit in your pasta, which will help with that elasticity and help uh, form those bonds together when you are rolling it and when, you, um, and when you're pressing it. Um, so we're gonna get five ounces here and then you're gonna mix your two teaspoons of salt into your water. We have one teaspoon, two teaspoons. I'm gonna go back in with my favorite little baby whisk here. 
and make sure that the salt is completely dissolved into the water. And if you've done this before, you've made pasta or salt in your boiling water, you know that it starts off white and then it becomes more clear as it incorporates. Please excuse all the noises. Um, in the in the first um, in the first art bites, there was Sarah made a reference to all of the five senses, and for me, that's what cooking is all about. That's why I love it so much. I'm completely engaged in the process. I can see what I'm doing. I can hear the noise, the things sizzling as they cook, the ding 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 on the bowl. All of these things are lovely to me. I can touch it. I can taste it. Smell it. You know. Um, this is why this is such a magical form of art for me personally. So we went right into the well. And then what you're gonna do is use a fork to stir in the middle there. I'm gonna try to make it so you guys can see as best as possible what I'm doing um, without you know, spilling everything on my countertops. If you spill, don't worry, that's part of it, especially with pasta and flour. That's the fun. It's no fun if you don't get a little bit dirty, right? So you're gonna wanna pull from the outside of that well and pull that raw flour into the middle where the water is. And just keep pulling it from the edge into the middle, from the edge into the middle. And we'll do that until it's fully incorporated takes a minute. So here's more of those lovely sounds. For those of you who have small children at home or grandchildren, you know, have been parents or been close with little ones, I'm gonna say at this point, if it's working properly, it's going to smell like that rice formula that we used to make for kiddos. I I don't think that's super popular anymore. Some people do, some people don't, but um, it's gonna smell exactly like that. And that's how you know it's working. When you get about three quarters of it mixed in, it's gonna, you'll see it's gonna start to stick together a little bit. You just wanna keep going with that motion of pulling it into the middle. It's kind of, how pasta works and you'll see once we start to roll our pasta we're going to use a very similar movement and process and when you get about four fifths of the way mixed in it'll it'll seem like your big glob of pasta doesn't want to mix with the dry and this is about the point where you can start to get your hands dirty um so if you take a little pinch of your flour mix in your hands and get your fork you can use that to just slide it right off and it'll come clean. So I have set aside a little bit of the zero zero flour, a little bit of the semolina so that you can put your hands into that to prevent yourself from sticking. I would use the zero zero on the countertop. And just do a little sprinkle like this. <laughs> yes, very clever fork cleaning trick. <laughs> Um, I definitely borrowed that from someone else, but you know how this goes. I'm not reinventing the wheel. We all had to learn how to do these things from somebody else. Um, but any of those tricks that I can impart on you guys today, I will try to remember to include. So now we're in the bowl and we're kind of doing that same motion where we're pulling from the outside to the inside, right? It's still a little bit sticky, you see. It's sticking to my hands a little bit. So we're gonna go onto the countertop now. We have a little bit of that flour there just to help prevent it from sticking. Um, I'm just gonna tap into it and uh, clean my hands off here a little bit and then get some more of the OO flour on my fingers to prevent it from sticking. A little like in a little baby's bottom, right? Okay, so now we're not sticking at all. So what we're gonna do when we start 
um, when we start rolling our pastas, we want to come from the front edge, pull it down into the middle. You're just folding it right in half, okay? And then press. You want to press with the with the uh, heel of your palm here. Just press right into it. You don't need to push hard. Just a gentle press, like you're giving a gentle massage. And then turn it, fold it back in, press. You see, it's still sticking a little bit. Um, some of you might be getting that. Some of you might not be getting that. It it really depends on a lot of factors, the temperature of your water, <clears throat> depending on where you guys are um, watching from, the elevation where you live will affect your flower as well. Um, so there's a lot of factors. If you, if you just trust your gut, if you feel like it's a little bit, if a little bit wet to work with, add just a little bit of flour. You don't want to add too much, just enough to keep yourself from sticking to it. And we're going to keep going with that. You want to keep going in the same direction. Um, I think it's easiest just to go clockwise, just because that's a very natural movement. So fold it, press it clockwise, press it. You're going to do this for a few minutes, um, depending on how soft you want your pasta. And um, the, the longer you go, the more firm your pasta will be because you are beginning to stretch and build those elastic proteins. Um, I prefer a softer pasta myself. So I'm not gonna go as long, but you can go up to seven or eight minutes doing this process of folding and pressing. Um, one way to know for sure that your pasta is, let's see, we're getting messy already, so I'm flinging it over here into my sink. One way to know for sure that your pasta is ready is the way in which it bounces back when you press it. So we're gonna give it a few more, few more turns here. Um, one thing uh, a viewer asked about the double zero flower. That flower is really popular in Italy and really popular with a lot of cooks and chefs um, who make pasta. The reason why it's so popular is because it is so fine. And it, for Italian flour, they rate their pasta based on um, the, the name of the pasta is based on how finely it's ground and how much bran and how much wheat is included in the pasta after it's ground and milled and shipped, right? Um, so it goes on a range, on a scale from two to zero, zero. Zero, zero being the finest. Um, so that's what we're using because it's going to give us that nice elasticity. And as far as the protein levels, it's going to be a lower protein count, a lower gluten count than some of your all-purpose flours. So this zero zero flour is going to rest around a 12% gluten level. All right, so we're getting pretty close. I can feel it's getting firmer. You know, you want it to, at this, at this phase, it's starting to it's kind of lumpy still. And it's kind of like separating and breaking. I see Nancy says, Chef, are you just working on a regular counter surface? Should we roll it? Um, so the, I am working on a regular counter surface. I wish I was fancy enough to have a different surface to work on, <laughs> but this is what I have. Um, so being that, that's a very good question. It's very important. If you are fortunate enough to have um, a stone surface to work on or even a, a stainless steel surface to work on, um, that's going to be ideal for this purpose. But you know, not everybody has that at home. So this specific countertop is a bit porous. So I want to add a little bit more of that fine zero zero flour in there. And what you can do if you're really working on a porous surface is 
honestly just kind of like rub that really fine flour into that surface and that'll give you that extra and then sprinkle a little on and that'll give you that extra layer of protection. So we're getting pretty close here because we really want it to be, we want it to be a smooth consistency on the outside. And I can feel that it's getting a little bit difficult to press. It's a little harder. It's not giving as much. When it's ready, you want to be able to press into your dough, push your thumb in, and have it bounce back for you. So see, it's sticking a little bit still. It's not totally bounced back. So you want to do just a tiny bit more and then it should be ready for us. Um, and I think I may have gone a little bit over the five ounces. So my crust is a little bit more wet than yours. Now, another thing that you can do with your pasta that's highly recommended when it comes to making fresh pasta is to prepare your pasta, roll it into a ball, and then wrap it in saran wrap. And then you want to put that in your fridge overnight. If you can let your pasta rest for at least an hour to 24 hours, you're going to have the best consistency. It's going to be the easiest to work with when you do roll it on your chitara or cut your shapes, however you choose to make your noodles. All right. So we're looking pretty good there. So now, I'm gonna roll this guy into a ball and set him aside. And since we're doing multiple steps, we're gonna hop over to the hot side. We have our uh, pan here for water. I'm gonna go ahead and turn that on. Um, so we can start the water and get it boiling because we'll need that in a minute once our pasta is ready. You can do this however you want. If you want to put your pasta into your bowl and then drain it into a colander in your sink or if you like to use one of these slotted spoons i like these to reach in and pull your pasta out so you can just do little scoops out into your saucepan that's totally fine whatever you're comfortable with me personally i have this little basket if you have if you happen to have a pasta basket too that's going to be ideal this one works fine. The grates are small enough that the pasta won't fall through. So I just go ahead and leave it in there. When I drop my pasta in, I drop it in the basket. When I see that it's done, I pull the basket up and you'll see that process where we toss it right in with our sauce. So now comes the chitara part. This is a beautiful tool that I have been fortunate enough to borrow from Chef Miriam who did our first art bites about wine. Um, not everyone is gonna have this, and I know that. <laughs> um, so of course, there, if you wanna cut your pasta or roll your pasta, there's plenty of things on YouTube that you can find to see how to do that. But today I'm gonna show you how to do it right here, because we have one. Um, one thing that you will want to do before you get started, if you have the chitara, is you're gonna tighten these two bolts here. Um, right now you can see it's pretty firm. If I press it, it doesn't move very much, but when it was traveling, it was, it was loose. So it's just like, I mean, it's just like an actual guitar. And that is where this tool gets its name because it looks just like a guitar. So all the chitara literally translates to on the guitar. Um, in Italian. And it was a very common tool used for pasta. I'm just gonna flour our roller just a little bit so we don't stick. And um, I have this beautiful stone roller here that you can use I, I, that I personally use for cookies and pastries. Um, but the roller that came, the wooden roller that came with the chitara actually works really well for rolling the dough out. 
So we're gonna roll from the middle out to the edge, from the middle out to the edge. And we're gonna do a lot of the same motion as before, where we turn it 45 degrees clockwise. Do a roll and then do another 45 degree clockwise roll. We're gonna move the chitara just for a moment so we have some space. But I wanted to show you guys that that's the next step. Um, again, my my past is a little a little wet. The now and see this is it always varies a little bit because these things you know these things are alive. They become alive. Um, so the first time I made this about a week ago, I was practicing the recipe for you guys, and um. It was not a very wet dough, it was a really dry dough. Now, one thing to consider too, is it was raining earlier today where I live. Um, so there's gonna be different humidity levels in the air. That also, just like the elevation, is going to affect your dough. The temperature, you know, the temperature in the room, how cold or warm do you keep your house? Do you have the windows open? Every once in a while, I'm gonna flip it over just to give a slightly different surface to work on and let some of that flour incorporate there underneath. And we're gonna keep turning it. It's getting more flat now. And the cool thing about pasta, right, is that you, I mean, you can do it however you like, however you want. If you want your pasta to be more thick, then, you know, then this would be a good time to stop. You're gonna have a nice thick noodle. Um, but traditionally with a chitara noodle, you're, uh, and then sometimes you'll hear the phrase spaghetti a la chitara or macaroni a la chitara, um, depending on which Italian grandma, grandma you're talking to. Um, the recommended thickness is about a five millimeter thickness. Um, me personally, I like it a little thick, so we're not going to go all the way. Now, since we are multitasking, I'm going to take a look and see how our water is doing. We have tiny bubbles, but no bubble movement yet. We're going to bring the tatar back. I don't know if you guys saw, but I used a little bit of a semolina. Now that we're moving from the surface onto the tatar tool, I'm utilizing the semolina to prevent sticking. And if you can see, it's actually angled. So it's higher on this end and it slopes down here. So you're gonna do it like that. And you're just gonna place your dough right on top. Since this is wider than the chitara, I'm going to just cut the dough right in half, um, just so I don't have a bunch of it hanging over the edges. And this recipe, the way that it's written, for the serving size, it calls for about seven ounces of spaghetti, seven ounces of your pasta, um, which is almost exactly half of the original dough. So if you just wanna cut it right in half and save that for later, I highly recommend that. When you do that, before you fold it over, be sure to add a little bit more semolina in between the folds of your dough. See, so that it doesn't stick together. Um, and that's great. That pasta, you could use that pasta tomorrow. You could use it the next day. As long as you have a good amount of semolina to prevent it from sticking to itself, I would just make sure you wrap it in saran wrap before you put it in the fridge so it doesn't dry out. Then you're gonna go onto your chitara here. And this rolling pin, I discovered it's less of a rolling action in the end. At first, you're gonna roll a little bit just to kind of press the pasta in to the tool. Once you get those marks started, 
see I have a little extra here that I'm just gonna pull off the edge. Remember this is, this is a pasta that is inspired by a countryside painting. So if you recall, Daniel said rustic. So if it doesn't look perfect, that's okay, it's rustic. A beautiful, lovely term we can use in, in the culinary world when things aren't precise. Um, so as we press in, you see the lines are beginning to form. Once that happens, you can do one more solid roll. And then, you know, just like rock and roll, you can just slide right down. If you see the pasta is falling through. Onto the lower portion. Now, because this is very fresh pasta, this pasta we just made, it's gonna stick to itself. Um, if this were pasta, that the pasta that you have saved and set aside, you make it again tomorrow and add your semolina, it's not gonna stick as much. Um, <laughs> Zen says, that looks oddly satisfying. It is so satisfying. This is why I do this. Um, it's very, and how appropriate that your name is Zen. This is very, um, this is this is very Zen, uh, very cathartic. I love, I love cooking. Um, the beautiful thing about working with your hands is it gives you an opportunity to just, you know, relax and feel and just, you know, work with your feelings and work with your intuition and work with your body. Um, let your mind relax a little bit, which I know with all of us, what, what has been going on with in the world over the last couple of years, having a hobby or having a task where you can just relax your mind is really valuable. Um, so if you can see what I'm doing, I'm just trying to pull those sp uh, individual spaghetti strands apart from each other before they decide that they wanna be friends again. Um, because they will, if you let them sit there together too long, they'll start to separate. So we're going to take a little bit more of our semolina and sprinkle that on those so they, so they stay away from each other. But I will say this, if you throw it in and it sticks back to itself, look, it's still going to taste delicious. It's still going to taste like pasta. Um, Thomas Gossard, why not use a pasta rolling machine? You could, you can use a pasta rolling machine and that is gonna save you a lot of time. Um, there's two reasons why I didn't choose to use a pasta rolling machine today. One is I don't have one. <laughs> and there's probably a lot of folks at home who don't have one. Um, but also the inspiration from the painting is this is countryside, this is rustic. so. You know, a lot of these, a lot of these folks at this time, um, when this painting is set in this in the Baroque time, are going. They're not going to have a possibility. They're going to be using their hands. You know, so trying to stay as true to that era as possible with a specific recipe. Um, obviously, they're not going to have a gas stove. I digress. So it looks like our. Pasta water is almost to a rolling boil. That's what you want. Um, I neglected to mention this earlier. It's not too late now, but we want to make sure that our pasta water is fully salted. I have my teaspoon measure in here. I'm just going to do, you know, three or four teaspoons. I can do a little more. Doesn't hurt. Um, you really want your pasta water to be salty. Salt, salty like the ocean. This is what my previous chefs told me. Pasta water, salty like the ocean. Got it. Um, I'm gonna give that a little stir just to make sure that the salt is fully incorporated into the water. And it's looking pretty good. So we are gonna go ahead and Toss our pasta in. Are you guys ready? Don't be scared. This is very exciting, right? So it looks like worms. This is good. This is what we want. 
I'm just gonna kind of scoop it together that semolina is helping keep it from stick. <laughs> she says, I'm ready and hungry. I know, I am too. I didn't eat lunch. So this is gonna be my lunch today. I don't know about y'all. We're going right in there. And as I'm dropping it in, I'm trying to kind of separate it a little bit. And since I am using the, um, the, the technique of putting it in the basket, I'm gonna shake my basket a little bit too so that the noodles don't stick together. Um, you can use whatever utensil you prefer, but I'm a tong girl. So I'm gonna use tongs to kind of separate these. This is my good arm. So that's what we're going with. Because this is a fresh pasta and it was room temperature, approximately room temp, a little bit warmer as we are making it, it's gonna cook pretty quickly. So now we're gonna move on to the sauce while that, while that boils and it should, be ready right around the same time. I'm gonna turn it down just a little bit, just a tiny bit. We're gonna throw our butter into the saucepan. This is a, I believe this is a sauteur, not a, a sauteuse, not a sauteur. Maybe somebody can correct me there. Yeah, the fun thing about being a chef is the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. <laughs> So I, I can't remember the name of the pan, but really whatever you have available, not everyone at home is gonna have the same items available. Um, I'm gonna take my tongs, like I said, tong girl, separate my butter just a little bit. You want your butter cubed. Um, you want your butter cubed if you can. Cube it when it's cold and then let it sit room temperature while you're making your pasta. That'll help it come up the temp a little bit faster for you in the pan. Um, sometimes I'm a cowboy and I just Muppet chef it, you know, just throw everything together. So you see, I just threw the whole stick in there. There's a lot of things you can do. You really can't go wrong with a lot of these things. And a lot of this is like, <clears throat> in the first Art Bites, Miriam mentioned the joy of wine being that, you know, everybody has a different opinion. Everybody has a different palate. Um, you know, everybody has a different way of approaching a recipe based on <laughs> based on what you like and what you prefer. I really appreciate the viewer who just told me that the water is about to boil over. See, twenty years. 20 years experience, I have a degree in this. Obviously, I know what I'm doing. No, I know a lot of you home chefs are way, way better at this, right? So um, some inspiration from our painting, going back to that, our original inspiration was to do a hunting pasta because of the individuals in the painting hunting the deer. Um, but then we were really inspired by what some of Dr. Daniel spoke about, the, the countryside and the earth tones and just like, you know, being out, being out in the field and being out in the wild. And um, we decided to go a different route and do a vegetarian. So that's why you're seeing some of these items in the recipe are items that would be procured from a place of foraging versus a place of hunting. Um, so in Italy, you're going to find wild mushrooms, you know, you're going to find pistachios growing, depending on what region you're in. Um, at the time, at the Baroque time, if I'm not misspeaking, we were not yet utilizing oil to cook in the kitchens. Butter was our main source of fat, or of course, rendered animal fat, because that's what's available. And that's kind of what this dish is all about, is we're focusing on what's available. So if you were to go out into that beautiful landscape, 
and you didn't happen to see the deer that day, well, you're going to be hungry regardless. So, you know, time to forage some mushrooms or forage some pistachios, whatever you can find. Depending on the region, obviously, you're going to find different olives. Um, so for those of you, you know, that have a slightly different palate and you want to, you want to, change up, switch up this recipe a little bit, you know, add some olives, add some green olives in there. Um, if you feel like this is a little mild, because it's going to be herb focused, herb and herby and nutty, you know, add some garlic. But staying true to our inspiration from the painting, these are the items that we're going to use and the region, of course. So our butter is brownie. So what's happening there is the brown color is coming from the milk proteins in the butter being caramelized. Oh yes, you said capers, absolutely. The capers, um, capers are lovely. And if you're fortunate, you can find really big ones. Um, but if you go to you know, your normal grocery store, you're gonna find capers. Um, you're gonna find capers usually jarred and usually already salted. Um, so that's something to consider. Anything else that you add different um, into your ala chitara recipe, you're gonna wanna account for its salt content. Um, that's one thing that I had to consider with this recipe. I could not source any raw pistachios. All I could find was roasted salted pistachios. So I'm going very light on my salt when we mix everything together because there's a lot of salt coming from these pre-salted pistachios. So, you know, this is a true to the painting, true to the inspiration. This is a situation where you work with what you got, you know. Um, so right now, I have a bowl that I've been using that has a little bit of flour in it. I'm just going to brush a little bit of that out. And we're going to take this pasta and just drain it right out. We're going to take a look because we really want it to be al dente. I had to take a pause from the um, from the brown butter because I don't want to overdo our overcook our pasta. And I wanted to show you guys a little bit. So very rustic, right? Look at this silly wiggly dude. <laughs> anybody making a mess? Is anybody making this currently with me? My kitchen is very slippery. The floor is very, if you get semolina on your floor up here, let me recommend that you put a rug down before you do this because I'm sliding all over the place. Uh, it's a very effective for making it so you don't stick <laughs> to anything. So the pasta looks good. If you cut it open, oh, I hope you can see. If you cut it open, it's going to be, you want it to be the same color through. If you're getting the middle of your pasta is a whiter, lighter color, it hasn't cooked all the way through. Um, so we're pretty good here. Um, it's firm, so it's al dente, like they say in Italian, meaning it has a little bit of bite to it still. Um, that's really ideal for a pasta. And then we're almost done, guys. Who's hungry? I am. I don't know if you heard my stomach growl just then. I, I think I was close enough to the microphone. So with the brown butter, I want to head back to that so you guys can see. No, it's very impossible to see, but you're going to want it to be a dark caramel color. That's really going to give you. It's really going to give you like a nice nutty flavor profile um, in addition to the nuts. So we're turning our butter back on our brown butter. We're going to toss in our pistachios. This recipe calls for three ounces of pistachios. Um, I like a lot of nuts, but I would say when you're when you're cooking it in half like this, just do half the pistachio amount. Unless if you just want a ton of pistachios, in which case go for it. You know, this is your pasta. This is your creation. This is your art that you're making that you get to enjoy. So, you know, you at home, you probably know your palate, you know what you like, you know how you like your food. I love mushrooms. Oh, I just saw a question, but I missed it. But I'm going to try to get back to some of these questions in a little bit, if possible. 
You're gonna throw your mushrooms in there. We're at like a, a medium to high heat on the brown butter currently. And you're gonna hear those fresh mushrooms sizzling. You can use whichever mushroom you prefer, but in this recipe, I have used three different kinds. I've used a baby bella, a shiitake, and an oyster mushroom. As far as the ala chikara pasta goes, um, one thing, one little tidbit of information is um, to know specifically that this is made out of peach wood, so it's very soft. So if you do get a hold of one of these tools, it might wobble a little bit. That's just because that it's it's made with natural ingredients and it's going to wiggle. Um, we're going to toss our pasta in to our butter. And because I love the tongs, I'm going to use my tongs and just kind of stir it around. You're going to get a little bit of that sizzle that I love because you have the water and the fat um, cooking together. So they're having a little bit of an argument, but they will, they will work it out, I promise. We are going to have our nest in there. And we also, we're gonna use oregano for this. So just strip your oregano. Smells good. <laughs> Does it smell good? Oh my gosh, it smells good in here too. Now you're really gonna to get to some good smelling stuff with that oregano, right? And you can use, if there are other herbs you prefer, thyme, rosemary. Um, I like the flavor of rosemary, but I don't like how woody and stemmy it is. I like oregano because it's a softer, it's a softer herb. And for this purpose, this is a quick, this is meant to be a quick dish, right? It's not a stew, it's not a soup. So you don't have time for, say specifically, the rosemary to, um, to soften. So oregano is nice too, because thyme is delicious, but the oregano leaves are bigger. Oh, is fresh much better or can we use dry? You can absolutely use dry herbs. And that's the thing I keep, you know, trying to stress is really, this is, you can use whatever you have available. As long as you have the, the base understanding of how to make the dough, um, really everything else from there is, is based on your taste and based on what you prefer. Um, I would say um, if you can incorporate your dry herbs in a little bit earlier into the sauce, so that they have time to soften a little bit. Um, that's that's gonna and it'll it'll help also partake some of those herb flavors a little better if you give it a little bit more time in the pan. Versus these fresh herbs, um, you can toss on at a la minute at the last minute as you're plating your dish. Um, so I'm gonna wait till the very end for that one. Get our dish here. And then as far as the chitara too, I meant to mention um, that specifically is coming from what a lot of historians claim, uh, the Chronicles of the Middle Ages, that it was specifically coming from the Italian region of Abruzzi. Um, so for those of you wanting to be regionally specific with the recipe, you have that information. And if you really wanted to focus on the Abruzzi region, then you can also focus on the other specific herbs and things that, um, ingredients that they have available there. I'm just gonna toss my herbs into my bowl for a second. We're gonna cut our lemon right in half. All right. And this is kind of an all minute minute thing as well. And juice our lemon. I have this handy dandy ancient juicer here. Juice it. And because I have the seeds in there, I'm gonna strain it. I'm just gonna do, and it's gonna sizzle, so be careful for this. We're gonna do a little bit of a lemon juice, just at the end to kind of finish it. This juice and this citrus is going to help cut down 
on the fattiness of the dish. Although me personally, I love butter above fat. Yes, and we are going to do zest, but I'm going to incorporate the zest in at the very end. That and the Pecorino Romano is gonna come at the very, very end of the dish. So now we can go ahead and toss our herbs in, right? And if you prefer, if you prefer that zest to get in there a little earlier, by all means, um, that's that's okay too. But I personally like to do the zest at the end and do the zest kind of as a garnish because then your tongue can differentiate it, so you have a little bit more of a complex uh, flavor profile happening as you're eating it. So our heat is off now, and this is looking very delicious, guys. Although, of course, it's dark over here, so you can't see as well. But if you can see there, oh my goodness, I wish you could smell it. For those of you at home saying it's smelling delicious, I'm so very proud of you. <laughs> so I'm using my tongs because I have extra butter sauce in the pan. If you love butter sauce, go ahead and just dump your noodles right into your bowl. If you want to keep it a little bit lighter, partake, impart some of those flavors, but not have it be super oily in your um, in your dish, then I recommend using either some tongs or using like this slotted pasta spoon to remove your noodles from the from the saucepan. So our mushrooms have cooked down. Our herbs, the oils are starting to come out of the herbs now, so I can filling up the room with the Nice oregano smell. If you really like cheese, you can add it throughout. But remember, Pecorino Romano is going to be really salty. So you want to use it sparingly at first. Do not add any of the starchy pasta water to the sauce. Not necessary or as needed. You are welcome to, to do that. That's going to help if you add that starchy pasta water to your sauce. That's going to help the sauce stick a little bit more to your, to your noodle. Um, but me personally, I prefer more of um, an oily texture, if I'm being completely honest. So if you saw, I just, uh, I just got a little bit of our Pecorino Romano and our microplaner here. If you don't have a microplaner, you can use a peeler, you can use a, a paring knife and just do little pieces and dice it up. But these, these are pretty magical kitchen tool. Also, I wanted to show you guys, this is specifically the flour, the zero zero flour that I used. And now at the very, very